wanted to be able to do today. It, Caitlin, Kate is here. Hello. Hi. She, she's not even listening. <laughs> so good to see you. And, and you're going to be going to uh, Santa Domingo, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Dominican Republic. Uh, this coming Friday, going to a deaf camp. Is that correct? And uh, how many people are going with you? My son's going? Oh, okay. Okay, I'm glad you let me know. So yourself, Moore, and Luke is going. Uh, Kate Gavigan is going to be going, and, so, and it's going to be a wonderful opportunity. They have an information table on the outside if you want to hear more about it. In fact, I would love to send our own people maybe next year. They do it every single year. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we spec, speak a blessing over them as they go over to, uh, to San Domingo, Lord God, the Dominican Republic. We ask that you'd bless them. We ask, God, it would be an amazing trip that you keep them safe and sound. Uh, Lord, give them traveling mercies there and back, and their health would be good. We also pray, God, that young children's lives would be touched forever as a result, God, of them working to spread the wonderful news that Jesus has a plan and loves them. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you with that. Hey, listen, we're going back to our series called uh, With Honor. And we talked, uh, this is our third week. We're closing out the series next week. I'm really excited about next week's message. I think it's going to be a really important message. We're really, you have to wait till next week, of course, but I want to let you know about that. Um, so let's, go, let's review quickly what we're talking about here. Go back to our series with honor. And what it means to honor something is to give weight or value to something. It's if you honor something. It's important. You give weight. You give honor to something. It's weight. It's value. It's worth. If you dishonor something, you take it lightly. And would you not say that our, in our culture today, we basically have become a, a culture that dishonors just about everything. I mean, the more dishonorable you are, the more comedian contracts you get, right? I mean, you watch news. You watch um, you watch any kind of entertainment. If they mock something, it's considered funny. Uh, if you tear something apart, it's funny. Dishonoring has become a real, real sport in our country, from the political process to your aunt, to your boss, to your family. Uh, you know, kids are taught to dishonor in music, music culture. Uh, some of the songs they listen to, dishonoring the police, dishonoring your parents, dishonor. It's amazing. And it's really become a popular sport in America today. But the funny thing is, it's not really very funny, it's we're actually hurting ourselves by learning not to honor what God has us to honor. And so when we dishonor, and so I just wanted to, um, just to review a little bit for a few moments about honoring, what honoring does. You can open your Bibles, which is right on the screen as well, at 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18. And while we're going to do that, the Bible talks about, I had an illustration the very first week, I'm going to bring these out again, because uh, I don't want to ruin I want to be able to uh, utilize an umbrella as much as I can, and they seal them up for me. Okay, there we go. It's hard to preach with one hand, but I'm trying. So, but anyhow, we talked about the whole thing of honor, and we mentioned that honoring uh, those that are over us, whether it be our boss, our parents, uh, society, government, what it does is it gives us a covering. It protects us. Like God has given us that. I wanted to read this to you. Um, don't worry, I won't sing, sing Singing in the Rain. Uh, but 1 Peter 2.18 says the following. I want to read it to you while I cover myself. <laughs> okay. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Why? For the Lord's sake. Whether the king as supreme or the governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil dealers. For this, the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put the silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice but as bondservants of God. And this is the important part here, the part I want to bring to your attention. Honor some people. Thank you. Honor all. Look at your neighbor and say, you're an all. Y'all. Okay. <laughs> if you're from the south, it's y'all. But up here we say all. Okay. Uh, honor all people. Love the brotherhood, which would be people that are part of our faith and our church. Love them too. See, if you can't love the people that are around you, you can't love people outside. So what does it say here? Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only good and gentle, but also to the harsh. 
So the Bible's saying, I want you to honor the authority. You're a boss, the government. And by the way, and some people think, well, we have a tyrannical government, this and the other, and they don't like our government, and I understand that. But do you realize the government that was over the apostles, over the apostle Paul, or, and, and also the apostle Peter who wrote this, was horrible? They killed Christians. They persecuted them. A lot worse than what we're experiencing today. And yet they said, I want you to honor them. Now, what happens if you don't honor God's authority structure, what you're doing, that one arm, so hard with one arm, okay, you end up poking holes in your covering. Every time you don't give respect. And what happens is, if I poke holes in my umbrella and complain about getting wet, the reason I'm getting wet is because I'm blowing holes in it. And so it's God's protection covering. The Bible says, the first promise, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you and that your days on the earth will go long. And so if you're not honoring God's protective covering, guess what happens? You end up hurting yourself. And you hurt those that are under your covering. Think about it. If I don't honor other people, my children will suffer as a result of it. If you don't honor your boss, God says, fine, okay, you're not honoring the structure that I have upon you. As a result, you're putting a curse upon yourself. And a curse means without God's blessing. So we talked about that that very first week. And I wanted to just to kind of um, give you a, an also another illustration before we break into today's. Ever hear Jabez? It was a real popular uh, series, J, the, book of J, the book, book of Jabez. There was actually a book called uh, Prayer of Jabez. Excuse me. There's no book of Jabez. There's a Prayer of Jabez that um, Bruce Wilkerson wrote. And uh, this is what it says about Jabez, who was blessed. It says the following about him. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable. Why don't you pay attention to that? He was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from trouble and pain. And God granted his request. Why? Because he was an honorable person. God wants to honor you and I. But in order for him to honor us with blessing, we must first honor him. Because if we're not honoring his covering, and, and the funny thing is this, we think, well, I, I just serve God only. I, I listen to nobody but God. Well, what you're basically doing is saying, I don't care about God's authority structure. And if you're not honoring God's authority structure, you're not honoring God. So today's topic is this, title, is honoring the dishonorable. How do we honor the dishonorable? Now, that kind of bogs, bothers me when I first thought of that. Why, why would I want to honor the dishonorable. If you honor the dishonorable, aren't you just kind of saying, hey, it's okay to be, be bad? Aren't you saying it's okay not to do the right thing? So why would I want to honor the dishonorable? All I'm doing is placating them and helping them be more successful at being bad. Why would I want to do such a thing? The reason why we want to do such a thing, which will help you understand, is because God calls us to. Now, what about Proverbs? Proverbs says this, honoring a fool is as foolish as tying a stone to a slingshot. I've never tried it, but I can imagine what would happen. Boom, okay? So why would you want to honor a fool? Well, there's a difference between honoring a fool and honoring what God has called us to honor. And we're going to look at it today. So the premise today is this. If we really want to see change in our society, you want to see change in your marriage, in your family, you want to see change in the church, you want to see change at work, you want to see change in our country, it's going to have to happen by learning to honor the dishonorable. Well, how do we do that? I know it bo some of you are going, it, kind of bo it bothers me too. But let's just share with you some stories of how this works. I'll give you some illustrations today. How many have ever heard of um, a guy named Noah? Yeah, this guy named Noah built a boat. You heard about it. It was a great world flood. And uh, it, was a, it was a horrible situation he had to go through. I mean, just the, probably the worst part was being in, in, over a year in an ark with a bunch of smelly animals. But anyhow, and so imagine that. And then at the end of it, the Bible talks about what happened. It says, after the flood, Genesis 9.20, after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. So some time has gone by. One day he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside of his tent. So basically, I think I kind of under, I mean, what would happen if the world... Can you imagine? I can see why he got drunk after all he went through. But he was as naked as a jaybird and as drunk as a skunk. 
Now, I've never seen a skunk drunk, and I've never seen a naked jaybird, but that's just a matter of speaking. He was dishonorable. God was not happy with his behavior. His, pay, his behavior was dishonorable. There's many different theories what happened and what he did. That's not important. The, part, the, the issue is what happened in the story. Now, what happened? He became drunk and lay naked inside of his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers, ha, Dad's naked. Look at him. Ah, look at him. He's all naked. Dad. I don't know what he did to his father, how he dishonored him. That's not the case. The point is he showed dishonor, probably made fun of us. Hey, guys, come here. Look at Dad. Look at Dad. <laughs> look at He's naked. He's making a fool of himself. Ah, oh, so, oh, yeah. So he's going to save us from a sinful world. Look at him. He's getting drunk. And look at him in j- n- naked jaybird or whatever. So he's going off. I don't know what a jaybird is, but I'll look up afterward in Google. Don't do it now, though. Pay attention. Okay. Uh, so what happened was he's probably making fun or showing dishonor, whatever that means, whether it was a horrific actions or it was just showing dishonor. And what happens next? Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way so they would not see him naked. When Noah woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done, and then he cursed Cana, the son of Ham. And the Canaanites were nothing but bad people. They were all caused all kinds of trouble. What happened is here you have Ham making fun of his parents, showing dishonor, and his two other boys say, hey, we're not going to do that. So what happens to two other boys he has? Shem and Japheth take take, say, I want to cover this. So they took a, a blanket, and they went backwards to show respect to their father. Now, was their father acting honorable or dishonorable? Dishonorable. What do they do? Do they expose him? Yeah, dad's a jerk. We should just get rid of dad. No, what do they do? They covered. In our culture today, have you noticed that we try to find something wrong with anybody? And as soon as we do, you know, in the, polit- in the political realm, something happened after um, just a little history lesson. When, um, when Nixon and the Watergate sc- uh, scandal happened, it seemed we are, not a switch went off in our country where we used to honor public officials. And all of a sudden it became, let's find something wrong because everyone has a scandal, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whoever. Have you noticed that? Ever since that time, very dishonorable, lack of trust. Let's point out problems. And so what do what they used to do in the older days? And sometimes journalists would know about our president doing things that necessarily were not the greatest, but they would cover. They felt a sense of responsibility to protect the dignity of our country. And here, here's two boys come back, and they cover their father. Some of you have not covered, probably your parents have been dishonorable growing up. Instead of covering them, you try to find problems with them, scandal with them. So that's a serious issue. You know, another issue is this. If you remember Jesus, Jesus was a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous man, as you know. He was God and man. And in the book of John, I'm going to summarize to save some time. the book of John, what happened was this. He went to a city called, an area called Samaria. Samaria was the place that uh, these were Jewish people that turned away from, Jew- from being Jews, and they intermarried with pagan nations. So they were called half-breeds, and the Jewish people hated them because they basically, um, basically left the Jewish faith, and they claimed they're still Jewish, and, this, and meanwhile, they're intermarrying other people, had pagan practices. They were considered really bad news, stay away from the Samaritans. Also, in the time of Christ, it got very hot in the middle of the day. And so what often you do, like if you go to other countries in, in uh, for Israel, Israel is one place. If you go to uh, Italy, for example, they have a siesta. And so uh, from about 10 o'clock to about 3 or 4, you kind of get out of the sun. It's hot. And so the people that were not of good reputation would come out at that time. And so Jesus went to a well. And at this well, uh, there was a woman who was a Samaritan. And she was kind of a loose woman, you know, kind of a woman, that kind of a party animal woman. And she's there at the well. And what does Jesus do? Huh. You, par- you, you prostitute. What's wrong with you? Don't you know that you're going to hell? Is that what he does? No, what does he do? He, what does he do? She's dishonorable. What does Jesus do to her? He says, hey, woman. He, said, calls, her, he calls her by a name that brings dignity and respect. And she says, surprise, you? 
a Jew, number one, and a man are speaking to me. Yes, can you give me something to drink? Now, if it, you have to understand, by, um, by law, what he would drink would be considered dirty and unclean. But here he's asking an unclean woman to give him a cup. He's showing her honor, respect. And what happens as a result? She opens up the door of her heart, and, and a relationship is established. What would have happened if he would have told her off? So she gives him a glass or a cup of water, and then he says, he says, why don't you bring your husband? Well, I, I don't have any husband. That's right, you have five. And then he dealt with her issues. Well, sir, I can see you're a prophet. The next thing you know, she gives her life to Christ. She becomes the first female evangelist, and the whole town comes to know Christ. Why? Because Jesus built a bridge by showing honor. If you want to make a difference in society, we must learn to be like Jesus and show honor, yes, sometimes to the dishonorable. Now, granted, there, there are times where we have to bring correction, and best example I can think of at this point, because I'm in a stage of life, is having little children. And how I love my son, Luke and Hannah, were really good about this. They had an umbilical cord, kind of an invisible one. So if they got too far from us, they'd stop. They'd sense it. I can't get any farther mommy and daddy than this. And they'd stay close to us. Matthew? <laughs> he's off. I mean, if you turn your head, he's gone. All right? And so we have to watch him. And sometimes he just feels that he's getting better now. But he thinks it's cool to play in the street. You know? He's like, hey, we're in a mall. Let's go in the street. And he's this tall, and there's all these cars. And so we have to what? We have to honor him by, stop it! And we have to grab him and say, come over here. I have to put the little fear of God on him so he understands that he can get himself killed. Well, that's showing honor. I'm like, oh, Matthew, it's okay. Go ahead and play. No, we're not doing that. We're showing honor for us not to care or be dishonorable. Okay, there's some more examples we could give, but here's Jesus doing that. How about this one? He honors her. Jesus honors this woman without honoring her alternative lifestyle. We can honor people that live dishonorable lives without honoring their behavior. How do you do that? You look at the person, you see beyond them. What did Jesus do for us while we were yet Christ? Oh, you mean when we got our act together, then Jesus said, okay, it's okay now. No, while we were still screwed up, Christ came. That's all part of it. So that's what happened to that woman. So with knowledge, Jesus had, could have scolded her and chewed her up and down. But instead, he showed her respect, he showed her love, and she changed. Listen to this. She changed, and an entire village changed. Why? Because he showed one honor to one person. What would happen? If you showed honor to somebody that worked, it was dishonorable. What would happen if we showed honor to someone that just drives us absolutely mad? What would happen? You don't even know. That's how Christ did for us. How about the woman caught in adultery? We all, everyone quotes this. Even atheists quote this one. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, we all know the story. You may not know the story, but here's a woman. I'll go ahead and read it to save time. John chapter 8, verse 3. As he was speaking, that's Jesus, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Well, first of all, how would they actually find this woman doing that? Could it be they knew the kind of woman she was? So they caught the woman in the act of adultery, and they, grabbed, they didn't grab the guy, by the way. Have you noticed that? But they grabbed the woman, and they throw her at Jesus' feet. And so that's what they did. Brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to him. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him. And then Jesus does something. He goes down. He writes something on the ground. I don't know what he wrote on the ground. I wish I knew what it was. It's driving me crazy. I have to wait one day to see him. Anyhow, he starts writing stuff. And he says, he who is without sin casts the first stone. He goes back down and writes. I think he was writing all their mistresses. Who knows what he was writing? These guys that could find a sin so well, because sin was right in their lives. And he says, and the oldest to the youngest leave, and there's no one left. And what does he say to her? Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Don't, didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. End of story. A lot of people just stop right there. See, Jesus. Now, what does he say? Go and what? Go and sin no more. But how did he gain the audience with her? What did he show? He showed her honor. He showed her respect. Why? She's made in the image of God. He, he looks beyond the sin, and he looks to the person. 
Aren't you glad he did that? Another example, how about this one? The woman with the alabaster box. Have you heard about this situation? This woman ha- had about a year's worth of perfume. Let's say $55,000 worth of perfume in an alabaster box. Jesus, I'll go ahead and read it to you to help us out once again. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt down behind him with his feet. Let me explain what happened in those days. I can't go into all the cultural situations, but what they used to do back in those days is they would have a nice meal. They would lay pillows on the ground. They'd lay up this way. They'd put their feet this way, lean on their uh, left arm, and they'd eat with their right hand. Sounds like fun. I like that. I should try that. They'd have a bunch of pillows and just sit there and eat and have a dinner. And their dirty feet would be away from the table. So all of a sudden, this woman comes in, not, in, not invited. She comes, she breaks $55,000 worth of ointment on Jesus' feet. She begins to wipe his feet with her hair and begins to cry. Can you imagine being in that scene? I mean, that, it sounds crazy. Well, it's like, imagine this. You're at Ruth's, Ruth's uh, Chris Steakhouse in Manhattan. And you're having a, you're having a meal with all these pastors and people, you know, these you know, Billy Graham, whoever, all there. And all of a sudden, a prostitute comes into the restaurant. Hey, how you doing? And she gets down, and the next thing she knows, she starts cleaning your feet and cutting your toenails. How would you like, I mean, what, can you imagine that? How ridiculous. Well, that's how, it was that ridiculous and even more. I mean, she had no business. She was an immoral woman, unclean. And here she is, coming, and what did Jesus do? Get away from me. No, he just says, okay. Which was part, by the way, what you used to have to do in those days when you go to someone's house, they're supposed to wash your feet and all that. The guy didn't do any of that. And so here's this woman who's showing Christ more respect than the man, the religious man of the house. Pretty amazing thing. And what happens is Jesus reads their mind, by the way. Then she kept, in verse 39, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, they said to himself, if this man, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Then Jesus told him a story. Man loaned a man two people, 500 pieces of silver, which is like another year's salary, and a silver worth 50, which is like one week's wage or one month's wages. Neither could pay. Which one would love the guy more? Well, the one that forgave more sins. Well, so this woman has done. I've done for this woman. You know, um, I, I remember one time being on an airplane and coming back from Romania or someplace like that, and there was this Indian man next to me, a wonderful guy. I was, ended up talking. We started asking. He was a computer programmer, and we started talking. Very bright guy, very nice gentleman. We, we had a good conversation. He, he said, what do you do for a living? Oh, no, I hate people asking me that question. I said, well, I, I'm a teacher. I don't want to tell. I wasn't lying, but I, once I say I'm a pastor, they shut me down. So I don't want, I want to have inter- dialogue. And I found out, we started talking about God. And they talked about, you know, Christianity. I talked about Hinduism. He said, well, I grew up as a Hindu, but I really don't follow it. I go to the festivals, this and the other. He says, I have trouble with Christianity. He says, why? He, I asked him, well, it because you can have a murderer and on his deathbed give his life to Christ, and he's okay. That's not right. That bothers me. There should be justice. And any religion that does that, I can't follow. He had a hard time with the mercy of God because it doesn't, it doesn't seem right, right? Well, what, how does this all work? I heard of a young man named Casper, a man in Casper, not Casper, Wyoming, excuse me, a young man who was looking for an income tax return. He made $8,900 salary, and he thought, I might get five, dollars $600 back. So what happens is the IRS contacts him and says, with, says, you need to pay this back within 10 days. You know what the amount was? $755 million. He's freaking out. It was a mistake. But many of us, if you think about the debt that we have to pay to God, it's like that. We can never pay $755 million, yet God still forgives us of our sins. You know, the Bible says uh, that Christ paid a debt we could not pay. Understanding Jesus' purpose. What did Jesus say? I've come to the earth to condemn it. No, what does he say? John 3, 16, for God so what? Love the world that he gave Christ, his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Then he says in three seventeen, for God did not send his son, this is Jesus speaking, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, 
You cannot save somebody if you don't like them. You can't save somebody if you don't show honor to them. I'd be, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone in the Bible that gave their life to God by, sh by being showed dishonor. God shows honor to people. Why? Because they're made in his image. Romans 5 says this, five, chapter 5, verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die most, now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were on our, no, while we were sinners. And since we have been made right with God's glory in sight by the blood of Christ, he certainly will save us. You see, what did Jesus do? He didn't wait for us to get the act together first. He showed us honor first. By what? I love you, and I look beyond your sin. I look to you. My friends, if we're going to make a change in our families, in our world, we have to look beyond this. Now, we still deal with this sin. Don't get me wrong. But if you want to reach someone's heart, you have to look beyond that because you have to realize that if not by the grace of God, none of us could stand before God. None of us could stand before God. You see, you can't show honor to the dishonorable until we know who we are without Jesus. We need to understand our depravity, who we are without Christ. Without Christ, my friends, we have nothing. Because Christ is perfect, and you and I are not. The Bible says all your righteousness is like filthy rags. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. Who can know the human heart? Without Christ, we are wicked. And so when you understand how much you've been forgiven, it gives you a sense of responsibility to give the same grace to somebody else that you received. The Bible says, um, for all have sinned and shown short of the glory of God. And it also says in Luke 22, I say to you that which is written must be accomplished in me. This is Jesus. He was numbered with the transgressors, which is a quote from Isaiah 53. Jesus associated with sinners. He was numbered with the transgressors. He didn't just say, hey, okay, come up to me and uh, join, you know, get your act together, uh, do this, this, you know, and then you can be a follower of mine. No, what did he do? He went down to the, to the very dregs of society. He became one of us that he could save us. He associated himself with us to save us. We want to make a difference in society. We must be willing to associate with people that are not so nice. Jesus does that. How do you honor the dishonorable? Because Christ is asking us to do that. We need to know how much God loves mankind. You know what it says in, in Psalm 8, 4 through 5? It says this, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. See, God loves mankind enough to send Christ. That you are made, every person is made in the image of God and has intrinsic value. Why? Because God's handiwork is upon the design of humanity. And we must understand that every person is of great value. Because Christ died for every person. But they have to, what? They'd have to be able to accept it. But they're not going to accept it if we're angry with them and we're upset with them. Honor only comes through humility. That's how honor comes. It comes through humility. You know what the Bible says? It says in Proverbs 14, 31, He who opposes the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has the mercy of the needy. Proverbs 15, 33, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction of the heart is a man who is haughty, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 21, 21, he who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness and honor. See, the big point is this, showing honor to the dishonorable, that they're made in the image of God. Sometimes you can show prophetic, what is prophetic, seeing things before they are, honor to somebody before it happens. Jesus was really good at this. Ever hear Zach? Zacchaeus, who was a, 
a wee little man, a wee, I, I don't know where that, didn't say it in the Bible, it was a wee little man. But I used to like to say it because I could say wee wee, you know. But anyhow, so um, he was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Well, basically who Zacchaeus was, Zacchaeus was a scum of society. Why? Because uh, the Jewish people were on the Roman um, subjugation, basically. And what happened, excuse me, and what happened was he would tax his own people and charge them more money to pat his own pockets. They hated tax collectors. And to make matters worse, he was a chief tax collector. He was obscenely wealthy and a betrayer of his own people. And so here's Zacchaeus, who climbed up a sycamore tree for he wanted the Lord to see. And as the Savior was passing him by, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus. Okay, so here's Jesus walking along the road. He could have saw Zacchaeus. Hey, Zacchaeus, you are a horrific sinner. You have taken advantage of thousands of people. You have patted your own pocket. You live with prostitutes. You do this, this, and he could have, could have tore him up and down. But what did Jesus do? Hey, Zacchaeus, and everyone, by the way, he's the chief tax collector. Everyone knows who Zacchaeus is. They hate him. He's in front of a crowd of people. And what does he say? Hey, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm what? Going to your house today. You know what that means to eat with somebody back in that society? It meant I accept you. I accept you. I find value in you. So what did he do? He overlooked all the man's sins, and he says, I honor you because you are made in my image, and he showed him honor. Now, what would happen if outside this church in coming days, which could very well happen, let's just suppose uh, the homosexuals are outside. They're upset because we're preaching the gospel. We don't marry two men or two women or whatever. And they have picketed signs out there, and they got bullhorns, and they're going out there, and it's a hot, humid day. It's 100 degrees, and it's, it's really stifling hot. They're outside. What would happen if I went outside and said, hey, listen, I see the, the leader. Hey, I can see you're kind of hot. Why don't we go for, let me give you something to drink, and I take them out to eat. People would think, what is he doing? What are they doing? He's showing them honor. Look beyond their sin, because I'm no better than any of those folks if not for Christ. Religion says, do, and then become. Christianity says, become, and then you do. And so one of the things we have to understand is we have to get rid of this mindset that we're better than other people. If not by the grace of God, no one could have a chance to take any chance at all at having it with Christ. We need to show honor to people, see beyond that, and don't play into their stereotypes. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to look down on people. It's easy to criticize. But how much better is it to show dignity to the human person and say, I honor you because you're made in the image of God? That will open up a door. Now, it may very well be that we show honor and the dishonorable still act dishonorable. That's going to happen, by the way. But guess what happens to you? You become stronger, and you become more like God. And God goes, I can trust that man. I can trust that woman. I can trust that teenager. I'm going to give them more honor and more grace because they know, how to, they know how to give honor to people. And that's why I have come to save people, not to condemn them. There's going to come a time where that will happen. There's going to come a time where it's too late. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, 27. He says, but I, but I say to you, who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. There was a person you might have heard of her. Her name is Corey Tamboon. This is back in the 1940s. She was in Germany. She was a Christian. Her family were hiding Jewish people because they were being rounded up by Hitler. They put in concentration camps, and they're being totally, you know, this, it's horrific what happened. But her and her family, what they did, they called The Hiding Place. It's actually a book called The Hiding Place. I highly recommend it. a great book. And what they did is they hide these Jewish people in the walls of their house. What happened was the Germans found out about it, Gestapo found out about it, whatever, and they arrested their family, and they executed some of her family, and they put her in a concentration camp. And there was this guy, this tall German guard with these blue piercing eyes, and he had like a little lisp. And he would kind of smile and take delight in torturing people. 
and they would see people that would be grabbed, and they, he would beat them up. He, he was horrible. He went beyond the call of duty, and he actually enjoyed bringing torture among the prisoners there or there. And she saw people she loved killed and destroyed by this man who had this accent. He had like a little lisp, a German lisp. And he had these blue piercing eyes, tall guy, thin. Well, the, the war ends, 25, 30 years pass by. And she's speaking in a church someplace. And people are just hearing her testimony. And just at the end of it, someone comes up to the front. And she immediately recognized this guy's blue eyes. He's a lot older now, a lot more wrinkles. Fräulein. And, you, see, you know, he spoke, <laughs> he spoke in his German accent. And immediately, it's like a rush of a moat had a flashback. She remembered all the stuff that took place, all in one incident. And basically, uh, you know, if, if she almost started to feel like I, I couldn't even stand. I mean, it's just a rush of emotion, of all the pain, of all the misery that she saw years earlier. It all hit her at once, and her heart sunk to the depths of her body, and she's like, I, I can't even stand here. And then she heard the Holy Spirit say, you must forgive him. And she says, I can't forgive him. And the man reached out his hand like this to her. And she said in her, she said, I, I had to sit there for a moment. And I said, well, Christ forgave me, a wretched sinner. How can I not forgive him? And she showed honor and reached her hand across and shook his hand. And she did. She said something broke in that room. And this man became a devout believer of Jesus Christ. What an amazing story. And that's what Christ has done for us. I'm going to ask the ushers to begin to pass out the elements, if you could, please. And also, if I could have Esteban make his way up. You see, the reason why we honor the dishonorable is because you and I are dishonorable. All of us were dishonorable. All of us have fallen short of God's glorious standard. There's not one that is righteous. No, not one. You see... The Bible is a wonderful thing. The law is great. But the law without love is a machete made to injure people. The law with love is like a scalpel that a doctor will use to help bring healing. My friends, if we don't have love in our message, it's destructive. It's actually worse than not saying anything at all. We must learn to be a people that look beyond people's sins, see them as individuals, show honor to them. I'm not suggesting we, oh, okay, it's okay. You know, I'm not suggesting you do that. There's a way to show honor. And, and to not to bring correction to a situation that's harmful would be showing dishonor. Do, do you follow me? If someone's robbing someone, you sit there, well, I, I want to show honor to the criminal. No, you go and you, you do something about it, right? You call the police or something, that's showing honor to that person. So inaction is dishonorable. The fact that we fought against um, Hitler in World War II showed that we honored God because he was destroying people. Do, do you see the difference? But look beyond the person's behavior and look for who they are. For not for God's grace, you and I would have no place to stand. So let's be people. We honor God by showing people honor. Well, I'm going to ask you a question today. You see, Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he did something. He had a Passover meal with his disciples. And I don't know where you are today. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. Welcome to the club. Anytime you have people, you're going to be, people mess up all the time. But God's a perfect God. I don't know where you are today. I want to let you know something. God sees your sin, but He cares more about you than your sin. He loves you so much, He doesn't want you to remain in your sin because your sin destroys you and destroys other people. And so today is an opportunity for all have fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot be good enough. So I want to pray a prayer with you today. If you'll pray with your heart, I believe it's a new day and a new beginning for you. Let's all pray right now in the quietness of our heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for stretching your arms from left to right, from east to west, that you love us so much that you paid the price we could never 
pay no matter how good we ever were. We're not good enough. But Jesus, you are good enough. We receive that today. We ask you to forgive me. Forgive us of all of our sins, both known and unknown. And Lord, we give our lives to you today, asking you to take us and to have your way with our lives. We choose and we give our lives to you today. In Jesus' name. No more am I the boss, you're the boss. If you pray that prayer, we believe you have begun the process of becoming a true follower of Jesus Christ. You know, something else I wanted to mention. I, I don't know about you, but I don't just want to exist on this planet and just get through life. God has called us to change the world by the love of Jesus Christ. The only way we're going to be able to change the world is by showing honor to God's creative order, and his, his highest creation is mankind. We must show honor to those who are dishonorable so they can know the honor of God. We must be humble. We must have a love for people because God has loved us. Jesus said, this is my body which has been broken for you. All of you, take and eat. Christ forgave us, just like Corey Tamboon, forget that, that, that Nazi guard, prison guard. And so, Father, we thank you for forgiving us of our sins. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take a drink, everybody. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? As before we leave here today, what is he saying to you today? Are there some people you're showing dishonor to? Could it be your spouse? Could it be your parents? Could it be your boss? If you really want to see change, learn to honor people. And build a bridge for God's love to shine through you. Amen? Let's all stand if we could. We're going to conclude with one song. As we do that, I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you have any prayer, any prayer concerns, we believe in, in touching together and praying on various things. And as a result, we've seen God move powerfully. So we want to ask you, if you need prayers for anything at all, a prayer for a job, home, work, health issues, whatever it is, we want to have our prayer team come up and pray for you as we conclude this last song. Go ahead, please. We raise our white flag. We surrender. bless you. May his grace be upon you. May the honor of his presence go before you. And let's see the world change one life at a time, showing honor to God's greatest creation, mankind. God bless you.